Hello, everyone. I'm Nancy, and I am your inimitable program manager. I'm going to immediately turn this over to Dr. Heather Hewson and DJ Herb so they can talk about the incredible study that they're involved with. So welcome. We appreciate your coming here and have at it. Okay, folks, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, just a quick thumbs up. Are you guys hearing, uh, hearing me okay? Yes, you're good. All right. Uh, and you're seeing the slides, yeah? Sure are. Okay. We might be able to do this. I did let all of my dogs out before this. Hopefully the imaginary mailman will not show up. Um, so guys, thanks so much for uh, joining us this evening. Nancy, thank you for having us. Uh, DJ and I are here and we're going to present uh, some background about the VICA project, which is a study of canine aging that's held at Cornell University. Um, so first, I think with that, uh, probably the best thing is at least to give you a little bit of background about DJ and myself and how we got into this. Maybe. Yep. Heather, can people hear me all right? Yes, you're good, DJ. Okay. So Heather, did you move to the second screen? There we go. Now. Perfect. So hello, everybody. Um, my name is DJ Herb. And I became an animal tech at the Vika Project in the spring of 2021. And I kind of had a, a long journey to get me to my dream job. Um, many of you who, from Ithaca will know that I have shaggy dog grooming. And I've also been teaching obedience classes for the last five, six years or so. Um, what, what many of you may not know is that I have been dog sledding for the last 31 years. And um, it really, the first time I got on runners of a sled, it, it changed my life. And it's just my passion. And I um, often go up to Minnesota and handle for my best friend. And you can see her and I over here, I'm the one in the red, um, out on a run with dogs. Anybody who knows me knows that I hate puppies. Um, it's kind of, I laughingly say I hate puppies. There's so much work with sled dogs to get them to a point where they're ready to become a member of the team and being a contributing member of the team. But I will ask anyone to get off a couch so a retired sled dog can be sitting on a couch because I just find them uh, very impressive, world-class athletes. And um, yeah, that's kind of how I got here. I have a bachelor's in recreation studies and I have a master's in physical education. So I kind of come at it from uh, the jump, dumb jock. I'm the dumb jock of the group. <laughs> so, and I'm going to pass... Pass along to Heather. Okay, so guys, I'm Heather Husan. I'm an associate professor at Cornell. Um, my, as I say, my day job is I am an animal geneticist and I study the genetics of multiple species, whether it's cows, goats, or dogs. Within the dog world, um, the genetic side, I focus primarily on working dogs. But as you can see from the pictures here, I have a background. I grew up in sled dogs. Um, my family raced sled dogs. We now we sprint raced, which DJ and I will get to in a little bit. Um, but yeah, we grew up, I grew up on the East Coast. And as the little map shows you there, I, I hopscotched around a bit on the East Coast, moved to Alaska, which many dog mushers that you know our goal moved to Alaska and run dogs. And then um my school and work brought me back to the East Coast. So now I live vicariously through my research and my students and friends. Uh, with sled dogs. Um, but yeah, so I do genetics quite often. Um, and then I also run this canine aging project that we're going to tell you about. Okay. If I could just get this to move forward easier, we'd be good. Okay, DJ, you're up. So I'm up. So on the top of the screen, you're going to see what most people consider your classic sled dogs. They're Siberian Huskies, Alaskan Malamutes, Samoyeds. Um, pretty traditionally, that's what we think of when we see sled dogs. And then the sport has kind of shifted a little bit. And these dogs down here on the left hand of the screen, you would look at and say, oh, I could see how those dogs would be 
um, sled dogs. And, you know, you can see that there's Husky there. The, the very bottom left is a polar, very rare polar dog. Um, and then we move into dogs who don't look much like what people expect at all. And those dogs are sled dogs as well, but they are a more sprint dog type, what we would call sprint dogs. And the dogs on the left being more mid distance or distance dogs, dogs on the right being more sprint dogs. So anybody who hangs out with Dr. Hewson and I has to put up with the fact that I am more drawn to the distance dogs. Um, I like the, the bigger coats. I like the bigger builds. They're not nearly as fast. Um, I, I like the idea that if I got stuck out in the middle of nowhere, my dogs would be equally capable to be um, able to withstand the elements without a lot of extraneous help. Dr. Hewson, on the other hand, likes to go fast. Go ahead, Heather. <laughs> So, so yeah, my background, I grew up in my family, we race sprint racing. So the distance racing kind of it's in, in its most extreme fashion. You know, you hear of the Iditarod, their races that, you know, they're a thousand miles. Teams are going eight to 12 miles per hour. Um, it's extreme endurance racing, extreme conditions. I grew up sprint racing. We have a short and fast trail. We sleep in warm beds at night. Um, that is what I like to do. And that's what my dogs like to do. Uh, so with that, you know, speeds are a little bit different teams that are running sprint are going, uh, 18 to 25 miles per hour. Uh, a sprint still for a slid dog is anywhere from three miles to 30 miles. Uh, you compare that to, you know, greyhound racing, that's a whole different ball game, but 30 miles is still a sprint for, for a sled dog. Um, so very different styles of racing. And you'll see as we refer and you see pictures, you know, you're going to see some dogs that are more sprinty or houndy because they have crosses in with them versus the distance dogs that have the fluffier hair coat, the more traditional looking Arctic breed dog. So if we refer to distance and sprint, this is what we're referring to. Okay. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background about sled dogs in general. And, and I got to throw a little bit of genetics in this because it does play a role in the research that we're doing. And I think, you know, as we kind of led up to this in the last couple of slides, um, one of the things that really comes up is what is the breed ancestry of an Alaskan sled dog? Because very strictly speaking, Alaskan sled dogs are a mutt. They are a mixed breed dog. They have this Arctic ancestry background of that Siberian Malamute in them. But with pedigrees, anecdotal information, you can mix anything in you want. It's not a closed breeding population. They're not a recognized purebred breed. So, you know, over time, we've heard of different kinds of dogs uh, um, being mixed in, including the ones that are in the pictures here. And through my research, genetic research I do, you know, one of the big things I want to do was say, what we've heard in pedigrees and anecdotally, what do we actually see with genetics? Um, so I imagine many of you as dog lovers have heard of, you know, Embark or the Wisdom Panel, these uh, genetic tests that can look at ancestry of your dog. This is the same concept I did with sled dogs. I just ran it myself. Um, so with this idea, what are the dogs that we find in sled dogs? And basically each of our kind of purebred breeds of dog they have this genetic signature, kind of a unique pattern that is, you know, associated with each breed. And so that's what I was doing with sled dogs, trying to figure out what do they actually have in them. So with that in mind, the very first thing that came up that was a little unexpected, but I guess now that I look back, not so surprising. And, you know, I know sled dogs are these mixed breeds of dogs, but the first thing that came up is that sled dogs are their own genetic breed. So even though they're not a closed population, they're not a purebred dog, they have been selected for intentionally for their athletic performance, you know, for a solid century. And this has created their own genetic pattern. So in Embark, in the wisdom panel, just as you would find, say, a poodle or a Labrador retriever, I can identify Alaskan sled dog. 
Um, and that doesn't matter if they're distance or sprint dogs. I can find a unique genetic pattern to sled dogs. Um, on top of that, I still can find within these sled dogs, in addition to their own unique pattern, they also have traces of purebred dogs in their ancestry. Some of them are older kind of ancestral traces, such as the Alaskan Malamute, Siberian Husky. Some of them are much newer. There's new crosses, you know, occurring regularly now with German short hair and English pointers and even Salukis. So I pick up a genetic signature of Alaskan sled dog, but we also pick up these other trace signatures. So that takes us into, you know, now you know what sled dogs are. So now we're gonna tell you about our aging study that looks at sled dogs um, and what we're doing with this. So we commonly refer to this as the VICA project. VICA is the name of one of our founders, uh, lead scientist, Dr. Andre Gudkoff, his Siberian Husky. Um, so that's how we got the name VICA. But with this, the whole premise of the VICA project and the VICA um, program is that it's a nonprofit program and it was established specifically to study aging in dogs. Sled dogs happen to be our model for this. Um, in this particular case, it was we needed a colony of dogs that we could study aging in. And because of the way research works, we couldn't take, say, rescue dogs of all different breeds. We had to have some uniformity. Um, but it's not like, you know, folks just, you know, there's a whole group of Labrador retrievers all out in rescue that we, we could adopt. So we brought in sled dogs um, and they gave us some unique benefits as kind of our study dog. So there is a VICA website, vica.org. You guys can certainly take a look at this later. It explains lots more details of the dogs, the science, the whole nine yards. We're gonna give you a summary of it. Okay, so the science, okay? Feel like you're in class now? We're gonna lecture about genetics. So in this particular case, what is the premise behind this project? Um, the big part of the project is really this idea that over time um, we accumulate DNA damage. As we age, we accumulate DNA damage. So we start out, you know, as these young, healthy individuals. Our DNA is young and healthy. It works, it functions, it replicates, all that kind of good stuff. Over time, as we age, DNA replication repair mechanisms, they become faulty. Just like, you know, the arthritis in the joints our DNA becomes a little bit faulty. So we accumulate more mutations as we age over time. This accumulation of mutations leads to symptoms of aging. So it leads to cancers, arthritis, you know, inflammation, all of those things. So that's a big part of we accumulate DNA damage over time. Some of the other notable things here is there's kind of a unique system that even though we know we accumulate damage, it's kind of, you know, we have different situations where you can have someone that, you know, smokes a pack of cigarettes a day for 40 years. And of course, they're at high risk for certain things, especially cancers. You can have someone that leads an incredibly healthy life. And regardless, they're still going to accumulate DNA damage. And despite how we live our lives, there's different risks, but we still have a species endpoint. You know, we have a general lifespan, regardless of how good or bad we lead our lives. So one of the things that we think that leads to this DNA damage over time is also this contribution of what we call retro elements or retroviruses. So this is kind of this ancient thing where viruses over time have basically joined their DNA into our DNA. And, and some of that is fine. It goes on, it doesn't contribute in any way, it doesn't cause havoc, other times it does. And so this replicates not only over evolutionary time, but over our lifespan. So we're really focusing on this part of these retroviruses, how that creates DNA damage, and then what it leads to with aging. So big picture in our project, we're studying the genetics, DNA damage over time, but we also have a therapy, an antiviral therapy for this kind of this virus. So not like just the cold virus that you're getting, but these evolutionary uh, 
genetics of viruses that are in our system. So we want to basically give a therapeutic drug that stops these viruses from accidentally being turned on um, and therefore reduces any symptoms of aging or inflammation. Inflammation is a huge part of those aging symptoms. So our research project does include a drug trial with the idea that we're going to try to reduce the effects of aging or the symptoms of aging with that. Okay. And big picture, and I think DJ and all of our team, the big picture for us is to improve canine longevity and well-being. So directly applicable to dogs. And yes, it is applicable possibly down the road to other species, including humans. So big picture, focus on dogs, but it's also applicable to other species. Now it's you, DJ. Okay, so in 2018, there were 104 retiring sled dogs. And I put quotes around retiring. Many of these dogs would still be considered competitive for recreational races or to be running on a recreational team where the person wasn't competing at all. So the 104 dogs that came to Ithaca were a minimum of eight years or older. So um, we had some dogs that were older than that, but they, the minimum age was eight years. And they came from all over the place. By plane, Dr. Hewson and a crew of students drove cross country. Um, some of them came, you can go to that next slide. Heather, and it, you can get an idea of where our dogs came from. Not just Alaska. We have one lone Canadian. Um, we have dogs from Michigan. We have some from the East Coast, Pennsylvania, Jersey, Ohio, um, Minnesota, Montana. So there, there are pockets. I know everyone thinks of Alaska as the only place where people run dog sleds, but there are pockets of dog sledders all over the United States, but I should say probably north of the Mason-Dixon. I don't know that it's that popular down south, but um, but all over the, the northern U.S. Um, once the dogs got here, some of the parameters that were worked with would be that they would live um, indoors and co-housed as much as possible with compatible other dogs. Um, they would be allowed access to outdoor playtimes so th that they could be outdoors. Our sled dogs are kind of unique in that regard for research animals that they get two time periods throughout the day when their groups are let out and they can be in pens that are very quite large, probably two times the size of a football field. They will live out their lives with our project. This is, there's not, um, you know, a lot of times people think, well, there's an end date and then we're going to euthanize everybody. This is an aging study. So everybody is going to live out their natural lifespan with us. And I would say it's a pretty decent gig for a retired sled dog, because I know there are times when we'll notice something on, on our, our dogs and um, we'll call in the vet side of the our community and within 20 minutes they're re get, receiving high-end vet quality care from the vets at Cornell University. Um, I think yep yeah, there we go. So the folks who are involved in this study we have Dr. Hewson, Dr. Luftus, and Dr. Washlog. Dr. Hewson is our geneticist Dr. Luftus' um, emphasis is on immunology, and Dr. Washlog is our medical director, but he's also involved with orthopedics, sports med, and nutrition. Then we have a whole host of undergraduate students that provide, they, they get credit, um, they're doing individual research projects, they're helping us at play times, they're helping us with conditioning, um, they're helping us with all facets of the, the program. Um, we have five full-time, full-time? Well, three full-time, two part-time, 
lab techs, animal techs, that's myself and four other people. We're involved in just about every aspect of the project, um, collecting data, whether it be with uh, the physical conditioning that we do or the behavior work that we do or the enrichment things that we do. Um, we're also involved at the end of life pieces where we're helping with necropsy and helping with some of the samples we collect right around the time when when our dog we lose our dogs. Am I missing anybody, Heather? We have a huge team. You know, we kind of put pictures up here mostly of the research side. Uh, and the picture on the right with the group, like that was when we first started. Our team is much bigger now. And I think the big part is, you know, it's not just the research side, but it's everyday animal husbandry. And we have a huge group in uh, Cornell's Care, so the Center for Animal Resources and Education, uh, their veterinary and husbandry team that work alongside our team for the everyday care of the animals. So it's a lot of people to make this work. And the, the care, so there is the VICA project staff, and then there's the care staff, and the care staff and that vet staff are some somewhat independent of our project. So it does offer um, different checks and balances so that we're all like on the same page about what is best for our dogs. And this slide will show you um, our dogs are single house when they're eating and they're group housed with compatible friends for the rest of the day. Um, they have outdoor, you can see our pens out here and, and down at the bottom of the slide on the right is our building. Um, as much as possible, we try to keep the dogs in compatible groups. Um, they live indoors, they get access to outdoors. Um, they, when they arrived, they had um, extensive physical exams and testing to make sure that everybody was all right. All the female dogs were spayed. Um, and, it was, and it was an interesting journey to see that while we had groups of dogs that came together, they did not necessarily want to live and play together. So um, we really shot for dogs that would get along with one another. And our, our play groups, generally speaking, run from anywhere as small as three dogs to as large as eight dogs. And um, feed wise, we are feeding Animate, which is a 26% fat, 12 or 13, no, sorry, 26% protein and between 12 and 13% fat diet. And everybody ideally is being fed the same diet. We do have some guys that are on special diets at this point, but we're, um, since nutrition studies are going to be following as when we have a lot of data collected, um, we try to keep everybody on the same diet. <clears throat> you, I, yep. So playtime is staffed by two, there'll be two staff people. Um, the groups you can see on this right hand slide, they are in different groups of compatible dogs. Um, we have them outside for anywhere from 20 minutes, depending on the weather to 35 minutes. Um, usually on a day like we had Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning, our dogs love that weather. Um, and when it's 90 degrees out, you'll see the, actually me and the dogs are going, no, no, it's dangerous outside. So we do, we do have some flexibility in terms of how much time we let the dogs out based on the weather. And our dogs typically have a, a narrower window when it gets to be summertime than they do at, during the winter. Um, I just had clean to up interject. That. There, there was one super funny thing when we first started this project uh, and we got to winter and the staff came back and, uh, or, or there was a question about, you know, when it gets cold out, is that okay? Can we put them outside? And I remember responding in our lab meeting going, 
they're sled dogs. Um, you know, the cold is not a problem. The heat is a problem. The cold is not a problem. Uh, we do have protocols in place for, you know, thunderstorms, cold, heat, the whole nine yards. But that was probably one of the more comical moments uh, that came up, you know, teaching staff uh, and our veterinary care team of what it's like to have sled dogs. So I had to put that in there because it's rather entertaining. Well, and I will say anecdotally that um, last winter I was working with a student and it was cold out. It was it was cold. Granted, it was cold outside, but not Minnesota cold. And um, we had a squall and I I love snow and I love winter and, ex and that extreme winter stuff. And I turned to Nick and I said, here it comes, Nick, because we're on a hillside and you can see the weather coming. And he said, what's coming? Now he's from Florida. And he said, well, what's coming? And I said, look, and it was just a gray wall of snow moving towards us. And we were getting dogs inside and he, we went to let the next group and, and he said, are, are we gonna let the dogs go outside? And I fling open the door, you couldn't see a thing outside the door that we let the dogs go out. And I said, of course we are, they're sled dogs and we all love this extreme weather. And he just thought that was the craziest thing that he'd ever heard. It's like, so he teases me quite a bit, but our dogs really do like to be out in this, in this kind of weather, even still. So this is the hallway that our dogs run down. Um, at the end of the hallway, you'll see there's an open door and it leads to these outdoor pens um, in the middle. Those are a couple of our guys. I'm pretty sure that's Red Cloud and Quick at a much younger age. And we often are out there goofballing around. We have stu a student who was more than happy to get dressed up for Halloween um, and be out there playing with the dogs. And it's good enrichment for our dogs as well. And it's also good stress relief for the students. Mm, that is very true. That is very true. All right, so so DJ told you a bit about kind of the everyday life of our dogs, how we got them here, how we acclimated them, and, and what their daily life looks like. Now, from a research standpoint, what do we do? So one of the big things about this project that makes it so unique is that it kind of a, comes across multiple disciplines. So big picture, as I mentioned earlier, we want to about, know about genetic instability as animals age. But much of our project is really assessing and quantifying aging in the dogs. So we look at genome integrity. We look at their physical ability. We also look at cognitive uh, function, their behavior, as well as their immune system. And then we also look at general health, you know, um, arthritis, uh, are they, their blood values, you know, complete blood counts and chemistries, liver function, kidney function, are they getting cancers? So we have genetics, physical conditioning, immune function, behavioral function, and then basic overall health. So we put all of these together to look at symptoms and signs of aging and quantifying that. So with that in mind, we kind of do a variety of different things here. Uh, as DJ mentioned, Dr. Joe Wachschlag, he heads kind of our general health. So he's doing physical exams twice a year. We do basic blood work, CBCs and chemistries twice a year. Um, now, once a year, we do CT scans. We did that for the first four years. We also did biopsies, real small, like the head of your pencil type of small, uh, skin, fat, and muscle biopsies. And then uh, Dr. Wachschlag, he also handles body condition and food amounts, uh, altering food amounts based on their body condition and their eating. So the picture on the left, you can see one of the dogs, they're anesthetized when they get CT scans, they got to be still. So they, they go through that. They've done that for four years. We're done that now. Um, on the right, you can see how serious we are some days, but in this particular case, um, they are actually going through and doing the biopsies on one of the dogs at that time. So another part of the research we do, Dr. Loftus, uh, he handles the immunology. So at different times of year, primarily uh, once a year, we do very extensive um, cell, cell investigations where we're looking at multiple different cell types that you can see here, cytokines, T-cells, 
uh, innate immune function and so on. Um, so once a year, we take a blood draw and he does a number of different panels. And then uh, every once in a while, depending upon the situation or a particular dog, um, he might do some additional immunology that we're looking at different cell types and response to inflammation over time. Um, we can have different cell types as we age and, you know, how our cells work as well as how they respond to inflammation. So John, he handles all the immunology. And then my role, other than genetics, is I run the physical conditioning. So this is where my background growing up in sled dogs um, has really come into play. For this particular project, unfortunately, we don't go out and run teams. Um, I know DJ would love that if that were the case. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> but what we do is two different things. So what you see on this one is probably our simpler of the two uh, physical conditioning tests we do. So we have a modified version of weight pool. Um, so within sled dog competition, one thing you can have is weight pool competitions. Now weight pool competitions are more of a measure of extreme uh, weight that a dog can pull. We don't go to extreme levels. We have a standard, the dogs pull one and a half times their body weight and they do that down the hallway because then we don't worry as much about the influence of like surface area. Is it snow? Is it rock? Is it pavement? Um, and that type of thing. So we always do this in the hallway. They pull it for 40 feet on the wheeled cart. And we do a series of three tests when we're testing. So with all of our physical conditioning, DJ is going to talk more about this, but we condition the dogs more to keep them familiar with what we're doing not with the goal of we're going to create elite aged athletes. We're not creating elite aged athletes. We're really just focusing on keep the dogs active, keep them familiar with this so that when we test them twice a year, we really are getting a good measure of what is their physical, how is their physical condition changing with time and not, oh, I'm afraid of the cart today, or I don't want to get on the treadmill today. So that's a really important part of our study. So in the pictures on this particular one, you can see really fancy. We use tires, we use weights from the rowing team, um, all kinds of stuff is weights for the dogs. We do have specially made harnesses for weight pooling. When we first got the dogs, we had to train most of them to do weight pool because they're used to being in a team. They weren't necessarily used to pooling weight as a single dog down a hallway. Um, so you can see Joe on the bottom uh, corner, you know, getting the dogs outside, just used to this by themselves. Um, and then you can see, you know, other pictures here with DJ handling the sled. Usually one person's handling the cart. Another person is in front of the dog calling the dog to. DJ, did you want to put any more on kind of how weight pool works, like weekly conditioning? So um, once or twice a week, we get all the dogs who are still actively involved in weight pull into a routine to come out into the ha our hallway. And we typically do it on a, a nice quiet day on a Saturday. Um, somebody is the cheerleader, <laughs> which is not my favorite part, but I, and I will own that. I like running the cart better. Um, and depending on how the week's going with the dogs, we will practice with them at one and a half times their body weight. If we know that a dog has been a little gimpy, sometimes we'll hold off for a week or we will bring the weight down. Um, it's usually a team decision between the vets, Dr. Husson and myself, about whether a dog is still going to be involved in the weight pull or whether we need to pull them from the activity entirely. At this point, our colony is at uh, 57 dogs. And of the 57 dogs that are still with us, 38 of them are still involved in the in the weight pull testing. Okay, so I'll give a little bit of background here. You can see pictures. Treadmill is the other main way that we look at physical ability over time. So uh, using the treadmill, we certainly collect a lot more data. Um, it's a lot more involved in what we're doing. Uh, with this, you know, we acclimated dogs just like we did to the weight pool and taught them. We had to acclimate them to running on a treadmill. And I can tell you that, you know, there, there wasn't 
sometimes it really surprised us. You know, that great lead dog, we had a couple of those lead dogs that looked at that treadmill and they were like, oh no, I'm not doing this. Um, so there's a few dogs that really didn't like it, uh, despite many, many efforts. And, and then there's a lot of dogs that really, they do fine on it uh, to varying degrees of enthusiasm. Most of them, I would say, really do enjoy getting up there. They like the extra um, attention. They like, you know, the activity. Um, there's dogs that you just come in the room, you let them loose, they'll go stand on the treadmill. Um, so, so yeah, many of the dogs really do like getting on the treadmill. Um, you can see Carolyn here standing over top of one of the dogs. We did this especially when we were first training some of the dogs to be on there. We found this worked and made some of the dogs more comfortable initially. Um, we don't do this very often now unless there's a case that we're really concerned of, you know, is that dog have any uh, lameness issues where we might need to catch it a little bit quicker. Um, you see the dogs uh, in the middle there. You can see one of the dogs. He has a racing harness on, um, especially when the dogs were first starting this and younger and super ambitious. We actually had a line from the back of the harness, just like they would, uh, you know, hook to a team and it's hooked to the wall. Otherwise, otherwise, the treadmill honestly can't go fast enough for some of these dogs. They would have ran right off the front. So we actually had to keep them kind of in place on the treadmill. Um, the picture on the right, you can see, you know, our treadmill collects speed, distance, time, um, as well as slope. You can put a slope on there as well. The, the pictures on the right, you can see are a bit more involved. That particular dog we were testing out at the time different ways that we could, that were non-invasive, that we were going to capture heart rate and respiration. Um, that particular contraption had like, uh, you know, if you go in to get like just the little electrode stickies on you to capture your heart rate, it looked like that. Um, but it was really tricky keeping it on the dog when they were active. That's not how they were made initially. So the dog had a spandex coat over them to hold everything in place. Then it had like this vest over them to hold the battery pack. Um, it was interesting. It was really good, but logistically it wasn't viable. So we do a much simpler manual heart rate before and afterwards. Um, and so on multiple blood draws, uh, when we test twice a year, otherwise they condition weekly with DJ and her team. So DJ, you want to tell them more about the weekly part? Yeah. Um, this particular treadmill, um, is unique little bit unique in that it has sensors underneath the the uh belt the belt thank you um so that we could actually collect data on how the dogs gait while they're running um and with the treadmill the the stakes are a little bit different than weight pull with weight pull the dogs initiating everything on the treadmill we start them at what is called their walk pace Typically, the walk pace for the dogs is, you know, around two to 2.7 miles an hour. And we let them warm up for a minute and then we bump up that speed to what is their trot speed. Um, I love doing treadmill because it's an opportunity to watch how the dogs are gating. It's um, an opportunity to really see the difference between our sprint dogs and our distance dogs. Um, you know, when I very first started with the project, people, some of the students would be like, well, that dog doesn't look like it's having any fun and it looks so different. And I'm the dog that you're going to, that you can see in this picture, she's a sprint dog. And so she's like, wow, she's always happy. The tail's flying. Her energy just like she seeps off different. of her. It takes over the room. And and they would be like, well, well, this dog doesn't look like he's having a good, because we do score. Are they having a good time? We do this whole scoring system about their performance. And a lot of it is, you know, how's their behavior? And I would look at them like, what do you mean they're not having a good time? And I realized that when our distance dogs get on the treadmill, you give them two or three strides and they just get into the Zen, what I call the Zen zone. And they're like, well, you can you can ask me to to run for five minutes or you can ask me to run for five hours. But I'm just not going to I'm going to use my energy in a way that will just sustain me for however long you ask me to run. Um, and I have to say that that definitely calls to my heart. 
And you def and here you have an example on the left hand side, you have a sprint dog. And on the right hand side, you have a distance dog. And that I believe is Nomad who was what ran lead. He did the Iditarod a few times. Um, and Johnny on the on the left hand side, I don't know all the particulars of his career, but um Johnny That's a, very much a sprint dog that ran normally a six mile to eight mile trail. So obviously floppy ears, houndy, he has pointer crossed into him, um, but you can kind of see his gait. I'm all excited that my videos are actually working. Um, and then you can see, you know, a little bit different in, you know, Nomad's gait here, but the sensors under that belt, you can't see them, but we're getting all of that data collection of where the footfall is, how long the foot remains on the belt, um, where it travels. Uh, and then, you know, we can get the raw data, but it also picks up things and has an, its own algorithm of predicting arthritis and what limb is that, or not arthritis, lameness, and what limb that lameness would be in. So, so um, although we don't have harnesses on these particular dogs in, in this video, we run the dogs in in a harness, some type of harness, so that if we need to, we can intervene and support the dogs while they're running. And then we also I say um, just quickly on there, we've changed kind of the harness. We started out with kind of the traditional just sprint racing harness, distance racing harness. As the dogs have gotten older and we've become more concerned of lameness issues, you know, we, when we watch the dogs on the treadmill, we identify, you know, what is that dogs, that individual dogs, what's his speed, you know, and, and if this speed's too high, well, we don't run them at that. We run them at a lower speed and some dogs at this point, they only walk and that's what that dog does. But when we test them, the goal is to see, can they make their speed for 20 minutes? And not all dogs do. And that is a slightly subjective, uh, it's always on me. Um, I will kind of confer with the team that's helping me with the testing, but you know, it's one of those where if we don't think the dog's going to be able to physically make it, we don't push them to extremes. This isn't an issue of like, well, you push them till they collapse. That's not the way that we work. Mm. We're still seeing, you know, even though it's a subjective of like, that dog, you know, it's gates going, I'm concerned it's, it might fall down. It might lose its footing. It's too tired. We're going to call the test and we stop the test. Um, so there is that issue to it that is subjective, but of five years, I've been the one that makes those calls every time. So at least I'm consistent on how I make those calls. Um, but yes, it's, it's testing their ability over time, but it's not meant to be an extreme test um, to kind of push them over any, you know, physical ability. We just want to see how their ability changes. Okay. And I um, would, I just want to add one little fascinating piece there. We have seven dogs all related. There were distance dogs. <laughs> of course they're distance dogs. They're my favorites. And it dawned on me to check their walk speeds and their trot speeds. So they, this is a team that has done the Iditarod. Accordingly, according to the, the person who gave us the dogs, they've done it several times. And they pace within one tenth of a mile of each other. So their trot speed, when, when I started working with them, all of them ran at 5.2 miles an hour. And I just find that absolutely stunningly fascinating that you your entire team would just gate so perfectly that you could do 5.2 miles an hour. That's just my little <laughs> waxing poetic about my favorites. Sorry, Heather, go, go ahead and talk about behavior. This is what DJ and I do. She she is poetic and and all about the distance dogs. Then I tell you about the exuberant goofball sprint dogs that are all about let's just go super fast. Um, yes, you'd have to come hang out with us. This is what we do. But 
the last part of our testing um, that's kind of the test that we do at our facilities is looking at behavior. So specifically, we look and we search for signs of cognitive dysfunction. So we're not looking at the dog's trainability. We're not doing that one. Um, we're not looking at their memory or their bonding. We are looking at cognitive dysfunction because it's a very similar characteristic to Alzheimer's in people. And it's one that dogs get progressively and it increases in severity as they age. So to offset kind of our other testing that's either once a year or every six months, we do behavior testing every nine months. So in our behavior testing, the big thing is what you see on the right-hand side, there are five different scenarios. Four of them are very, very similar, the top four, in that we have a room that kind of looks like, you know, this crazy disco floor with all these boxes, pink boxes, gray boxes, and there's a camera that is on the ceiling. And we take videos of the dogs in these different scenarios. So the first four scenarios, they are all in there in three minute intervals. So you take the dog into the room, the handler steps out, it's just the dog in the room, and we're recording this behavior for three minutes. However, the scenario in the particular test changes. So one of those tests is what we call open field. There's nothing else in the room. It's the dog and that's it. So you record, does the dog you know, lay at the door? Do they pace around? Do they go to the middle of the room, to the edges of the room and so on? Um, the next one, novel objects. So we get objects, toys, things they've never seen. We put them in the room, we see what they do. Another one, novel person. So we get volunteers from the local community and they come in and I would fail this completely. We gown them up because we've had accidents. So we put them in kind of like surgical scrubs and gowns, uh, booties and everything. And then they just have to sit in a chair in the middle of the room and not even interact with the dog at all. They just got to sit there and you see what the dog does. We've had dogs pee on the people, so we gown them up. Um, the mirror test is the last one that's kind of of those four. We put a mirror on the wall. You watch how the dog uh, handles this. Um, the very last test, the detour test, is slightly different. So that is the one test we have where there is a little bit of a difference in that you see how do they learn or problem solving. So in this particular one, the V itself is made out of, of uh, a fence. So it's still in the same room, but we have a fence that's put in a V. So it's those, you know, three foot high fences that you have like for puppies, metal fence, they can see through it, but we put it in a V. And in the first uh, couple trials, you put food or a toy, something that they're motivated for, you put it on the inside of the V. In this particular scenario, a handler brings the dog in, shows them the food that's on the other side of the fence inside the V, and then lets them off leash. And you just wait and see if the dog can figure out to go out and around and come back and find the food. Um, you have the dogs that try to push through the fence. You have the dogs that don't care. Um, so you have various scenarios. You do this uh, two different times, and then you switch it around. You put the dog on the inside and the treat thing on the outside and see if they can solve that. So we run these tests every nine months. Between that, we do not expose the dogs to that scenario or situation. We also do some other stuff to evaluate behavior and that includes questionnaires that we make our animal handlers like DJ fill out. And we also do a little bit of blood work because there's certain uh, biomarkers that are also related to cognitive dysfunction. So the main thing, is the physical test, but then we have supporting data with biomarkers and the questionnaires. So those are every nine months. And, oh yeah, did you wanna add more to that, DJ? Yeah, I was gonna say that we, one of the things that we've been working on is a quality of life assessment tool that could be used by a veterinarian or a pet owner or you know, the general population to determine when it may or may not be time to, to end a dog's life. Um, those, there are two groups working, they're, we're working blind. I work with Dr. Jackson and one of my colleagues works with another doctor and we're working separately 
and not conferring with each other. And we'll see how those results, That's that's been in the works for about a year now, so that there's a monthly quality of life assessment tool that's done. Um, and it's an objective measure with an objective rating, um, but it doesn't necessarily, and, and it doesn't mean that if, if a dog gets a high score, they're automatically euthanized. Um, it just means these are the these are the things impacting that dog's quality of life. Sorry, right. go ahead, doctor. So you know we've shown you kind of the dog's everyday mm -hmm. life, uh, what it's like for them. Um, we've also kind of walked you through the research components and and the different uh, approaches we take to assess aging. Um, as far as our project right now, we're in about year five of the project now. So we did one drug trial uh, that we worked on for three years. Um, we have now have all that data that we need to analyze. And we've just started a slightly different drug trial with the dogs that we have remaining. Uh, it still is looking at that genome instability, but it kind of tackles it from a slightly different genetic and chemical reaction. So we're kind of just at the point where we're really starting to analyze data um, and we're continuing to collect data. So we do have one publication out that kind of shows more the setup of our project. This big figure here, you don't need to go through all of it, but the big picture is that, you know, in this paper where we're showing like, this is um, the way that we set up a study on canine aging. And it does show some of our preliminary data looking at immune biomarkers with behavioral markers with physical activity and how they are coinciding and we're seeing those changes over time. Um, with that, you know, kind of project completion, as DJ said, you know, the dogs, there is not a specific endpoint other than it's when it's that dog's time, whether they pass away naturally or we look at quality of life and that is a group decision uh, primarily among the investigators and the lead veterinarians, but all of the, you know, our staff gives us input. They see the dogs the most, so they're all giving us input. Um, when they do pass away, it is one of the most critical time points for our research. All of the dogs undergo full necropsies, so we're collecting multiple samples and getting really valuable data uh, that comes through there. Um, but there is also an emotional toll for our staff and everyone that works on this project and everyone, you know, they handle it and they cope with this in different ways. And we do honor the dogs and their contribution to the research. Uh, one of the things in our office, we have paw prints and collars and pictures of all of our dogs that have passed away, which is both sad and honorable at the same time. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a big thing. You know, everyone has their favorite dogs. Everyone, um, you know, enjoys things about the project, but it is a tough project. It's a project on aging, which includes the dogs passing away. DJ, do you want to put anything on that one too? Um, I think I think the last thing I would, would say about honoring the dogs is um, that we we have, um, we'll, we'll collect a paw print from the dogs. We also collect hair from the dogs. And each year, um, the dogs that I have the hair from, I take them back to Minnesota with me and take them on their final run. And usually my best friend, Kathleen, who owns this company, she and I take a senior team and the seniors spread the, spread the, the hair of the dogs that we've lost for that particular year. Um, I think we're at the point where we could handle Oh, I forgot. How long is this, DJ? I think it's a minute and a half. Okay. So folks, I'm going to put this in because I thought this was super awesome. DJ put this together as kind of a Christmas wish for all of the staff and we loved it. So here's a video that DJ put together of our dogs and let's see if I can get it to play. Thank you. 
All right, folks, that's all we have to present to you officially. And I know we only have a few minutes, but I think we're happy to answer any questions you guys have. You're welcome to unmute or throw stuff in the chat box if you want. Let's see. Hi. Go ahead. My name's Judy. Um, I found this fascinating. Um, I think it's just the implications of your research are incredible for everybody. I'm very interested in the behavioral aspects. So I'd like to know how, what percentage of the dogs do you think do experience um, significant um, cognitive decline um, as they age? And also I have to say, you know, I've seen, had a lot of dogs that I train that um, see themselves in, in a mirror, and when they see it for the first time, they have different reactions. Um, but after they know what a mirror is, they'll ignore it. Just, <laughs> just got to say that. So, yeah, I'm I'm interested in the incidence of cognitive decline. So I would say we're still in the midst of evaluating the data from it. And what we have evaluated was kind of the early data, so it was when they were younger. And at that point, you know, we really, the youngest dog, so when we started this, the dog age range was eight to 11 years old. Now, you know, our youngest dogs are around 12 years old. Um, but with that said, you know, within the first couple of years, that eight to 11 range, you know, it was pretty minimal. There were only a few dogs out of the hundred and some that were really showing, you know, clinical signs that we were seeing a statistical difference um, in, you know, unaffected and affected. Uh, with that, you know, I would say it's certainly starting to change. You know, we're seeing more as they age, but I don't have the statistical data and I'm definitely a researcher to heart. So it's like, if I don't have the stats to back it up, I can't tell you exactly what we got. Um, but, you know, we are seeing more dogs that are showing more signs. And I think it's, for me studying this, this wasn't something that was really on my radar before I started this study. And I've been fascinated and I think, one of the take homes for me is I have eight dogs at home. Two of them are, you know, 14 and 10. And I would say as many pet owners, I imagine we don't really realize our dogs are showing these symptoms and, and it really is cognitive dysfunction like Alzheimer's. Um, I think we say, oh, it's an old dog, but we don't realize how similar it is to what we have in humans. So that's kind of that. Your quick thing on the behavior with the mirror. We do run into the, some of the same issues, and from a statistical standpoint, we can kind of put that into our models and say, yep, you know, they've seen this before, so that's a little bit of a different reaction than that very first time they saw it. But the good thing is, we at least try not to show them those scenarios in between the nine-month period. So, and I think I, think I would add that it's more, and it, this may be because of the breed that we're working with, but typically when decisions about quality of life are being made, 
it's much more likely that they're being made about physical physical decline than it is cognitive decline. At least with our population, that's that's been my experience. Um, Thank you. No problem. There's a question in the chat that says, how do we control for exposure to anesthetic, x-rays, um, those types of things contributing contributing to DNA damage um, that we're measuring? And, and I would say in, in the big picture, we can put some of those things, like we know how many times, at least during the duration of our project, they've been exposed to anesthesia or CT scans. It's rare that our dogs get x-rays unless they have a medical condition that requires them to get x-rays for kind of diagnosis uh, or follow-up on treatment. Um, so yeah, we can put those in kind of our statistical models, but in the big picture, um, other than the dogs getting the anesthesia once a year for CTs and occasionally for dentals, they really aren't getting much different exposure than many pet dogs that, that are on a pretty solid regime of uh, medical care. All right. Any other questions? So I, I actually have a, a question for one of our participants. Kimberly Maxwell, can you tell me what the, what the temperature is in Fairbanks right now? <laughs> You're muted, Kimberly. Sorry. I'm mute. I'm mute. Okay, I'm back. Um, I think it's pretty warm. It's the 18, so it's pretty balmy. <laughs> excellent excellent we have a excellent. we have a student up there right now following the yukon quest so oh yeah yeah are, are very interested in uh yeah how, how we, li we live up in the hills and so we get we get uh warmer temperatures up here and and um it's looking like it's five six below in town this morning so it's warmed up significantly but yeah. <laughs> while, while I have your attention, um, a question about diet. I didn't see it mentioned, but have you guys done any um, experimenting with incorporating um, uh, foods that are stereotypically um, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory foods like humans incorporate into their diet, um, uh, brassicas, uh, flaxseed meal, um, blueberries, pumpkin, that kind of thing, incorporate any control work that you've done comparing, I mean, I guess it's been going on for five years, so um, it might be hard to tell, but. So pretty much our dogs are all on a, a commercial dry diet, Animate. Um, some of those things are incorporated in the diet, but that diet is uh, formulated for performance working dogs. So we've mm -hmm. kept it at I'm pretty sure the performance of the animate choice. Um, so we we don't typically, because we're trying to use the nutrition as a control for later mm -hmm. study, um, mm -hmm. we don't typically add in enrichment foods or mm -hmm. make additional foods in there unless we have dogs that go on a hunger strike. And then, and then we're adding things like wet food or maybe we'll... Um, I think that's probably why Dr. Hewson allowed me to come and work at the project. Because uh, there's there's traditional things you can try with sled dogs to get them to eat. Um, mm -hmm. One of the hallmarks for any musher is, do they eat? Will they drink? Will they eat? Will they pull? Mm -hmm. And um, some of our guys, um, we jokingly say, because uh, Dr. Washlog ran, ran dogs as well, that they sent us their non-eaters. Right. So we, we, um, we generally speaking have about 10, 10 or 11 dogs that are chronically, they don't like to eat. So we're always giving them enrichments, but in terms of a heavy duty nutrition study with brassicas or the flax, we, we haven't been branching out into that. So do you supplement with, um, like fish or, you know, the, the classic? No. Okay. Yeah. What do you know? They're, they're on the animate, kind of the main food. And then the only time they're getting, you know, uh, additional food or treats um, 
is really for enticements if they don't eat well. Now, so the it's a, yeah, so referring to specifically to the non-eaters, what what supplements do you give those those guys? So the non the non-eaters um, will like everything is cooked, mm -hmm. right? So we'll give at times fish, tuna fish or canned Purina Pro Plan, like mm -hmm. a chicken and a rice. Um, liver, there's one of our staff that will make an organic chicken puree for, for the dogs that won't eat. Um, I'm trying to think what else have we, well, eggs, eggs, eggs are very, the dogs oftentimes will eat eggs. Mm -hmm. Um, the occasional, I, I would say that there's a researcher or two that have occasionally snuck in breakfast sandwich, <clears throat> Dr. Hewson. They just get the last bite. The last bite. Tradition. It, yes. So do, yeah. do you find that um, that's happening with older dogs or not necessarily? Do you have youngins? Well, I guess they're all. They're all old. old. But, um, yeah. But, but I would say some of them, part of our picky eaters uh, from a little of the history we know have been always picky eaters where mm -hmm. other ones were not really picky eaters and to, until they aged further. Mm -hmm. So we have kind of a mix. All right, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Good to I see you. I put a little thing up in the chat. I don't know if everyone saw it. Um, we did find already a correlation between uh, cognitive dysfunction, the dogs that display it and kind of the severity of it uh, with Dogs that are active, so the dogs that are on our treadmill and weight pool program, um, they have a slower um, move into showing those cognitive dysfunction uh, signs. So I think, you know, being that we have many dog lovers that are here very active with their dogs, it's a very good thing for your dogs, of course, in many ways. All right, and, Nancy, you want to take control? Well, I'm just wanted to give people another 10 or 20 seconds to see if they have any additional questions. This was fa definitely a fascinating um, top talk, and I'm so glad that you were both willing to come on and share your um, knowledge and your expertise. It's, it's been a great talk. Well, All right, we, you saw both sides. We, we sure did. We sure did. So it doesn't look like there's anything else. I want to thank you both for, for your time and your energy. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, Thanks so again. Much. Have a good night, guys. Bye for now. Good night.